Hi guys, Dr. J here. When you have kidney failure, if you want to continue to live, you have two choices, going on dialysis or getting a transplant kidney. So which is better? In a preceding video, we showed how a transplant kidney allows you to live longer with longer survival and live better with better quality of life. So most people would say that a transplanted kidney is the better option. Here's the problem though. If you look at the wait list for kidney transplantation, there's 50,000 people in the US on the wait list. But if you look at the number of deceased donor transplants in blue, that's not enough. And even if you add living donors to get the total number of kidney transplants, living donor and deceased donor transplants in red, that's still not enough, meaning that most people have to wait at least five years to receive a kidney transplant. Do a few years of dialysis really matter that much? Well, in this study, this group published, they took care of this problem in a very clever way. What they did is they took deceased donors and then they reviewed the records and found deceased donors who of course donated two kidneys, but one kidney went to someone a long time on dialysis and the same donor donated a kidney to someone a short time on dialysis. This was coincidental and they just found this in the records. The beauty of this study though is that it's the same donor. The kidneys are exactly the same quality since they come from the same donor. The only difference in potential outcome is the time on dialysis. So what did they find? They looked at 2,405 kidney transplants and the short time on dialysis, less than six months, had an event-free survival, which is basically a survival without getting in trouble, according to this curve, whereas the people long time on dialysis greater than two years had a much lower curve. Clearly, they did not do as well. Why is that? When you start on dialysis, you're still in pretty good shape, but because kidney failure on dialysis is like a body rest, it's kind of an insidious gradual damage, and if there's enough of it, it can't really be reversed. So you end up with a damaged body, which sometimes will get somewhat better with the transplant, but usually does not. Some of the damage is permanent, and even some patients do so poorly on dialysis that they can't even get a transplant. So what kind of examples of permanent damage occur after years of dialysis that damage your body? The kidney is involved in bone metabolism through vitamin D, calcium, and phosphorus regulation. So when you have kidney failure, you get kidney bone disease called renal osteodystrophy. And taking apart the name, renal means kidney, osteo means bone, and dystrophy means abnormal growth. Who do you think is gonna be most affected by abnormal growth? Children, of course, because they're growing. If you compare normal bones to the bones of children with years of kidney failure on dialysis, the children have marked deformities, and these deformities are permanent. So even if you get a transplant, because they've grown with these deformities, they're stuck with them for their entire life. Also, these children tend to be of short stature. So these are examples of permanent defects, and this is why a lot of parents are extremely eager to get a transplant for their kids so that they grow up to be as normal as possible without any permanent sequela. What about in adults? If you look at healthy bone, focusing on this area, here's an example of osteoporosis. You can see the bone is much less dense. In kidney failure, it's like osteoporosis on steroids. So it exaggerates any existing osteoporosis, and even if you don't have osteoporosis, it damages your bones. So a lot of adults have spinal fractures and hip fractures, and these are things that are, of course, permanent, even if you do get a transplant eventually. The other problem is we focused on this area, and if you look at the patient with renal failure, and you focus on this area, we said there's osteoporosis, but I had hidden a very significant finding. You can see in this patient that there are blood vessels lined with calcium. That's literally hardening of the arteries. The arteries are typically represented in red in most systems, and let's look at the center of the body here, the lower aorta. In a real patient with renal failure, you can see the whitish calcification of the aorta here magnified. Of course, if these are very severe, this can be highly damaging to blood vessels. Now let's focus on another area in the pelvis near the leg. And the reason to focus on this area is this is where a kidney transplant goes. An x-ray of a patient who is recently listed for a kidney transplant. And because we know that kidney failure leads to hardening of the arteries, we routinely get x-rays like this to check to see if patients are okay to transplant. Look at what happens to this patient, the same patient, a year later. One year later, the vessels are markedly damaged. You can see the narrowing in these two areas, and on the other side, it's completely blocked. Why does that matter? Sewing vessels together requires a delicate needle and very careful, precise surgical technique. But when you have hardening of the arteries, such as occurs after years of dialysis, the vessels are impossible to sew. 
In fact, it would be dangerous because it's like sewing in a rock and so the vessel just falls apart. The other problem with hardening of the arteries is it narrows the inside of the arteries and leads to blockage of arteries. This is a big problem for the heart and explains why heart attacks are the leading killer in renal failure. Now, if you look at the heart mortality in the general population, here you have age and here you have annual mortality. And just to go over how the scale works, it's a log scale. So here is 25 to 34 year olds and here is so 0.1 percent then you hit this area which is the 45 to 54 year olds if you go up 10 times more you hit one percent that's this area that's the 65 to 74 year olds and if you go 10 times more that's this area and that's the 85 year olds and notice that the 85 year olds have basically a thousand times more heart disease than the 25 to 34 year olds this is completely expected since heart disease is much more common in 85 year olds than in 25 year olds look at the dialysis population However, let's look at the 25 to 34 year olds on dialysis. And that corresponds to this level of mortality. How does that correspond to the general population? That's somewhere around 84 to 85 year old. So you could say that a 30 year old on dialysis from a point of view of heart disease is like an 84 year old without dialysis. And this is what I mean when I say that dialysis is like a rapid aging of the body or like rust. It's because when you're on dialysis, your body is not completely cleared of the poisons the way a kidney does. And as a result, you undergo gradual damage. If you start out already old and somewhat damaged, you may not be able to undergo transplant after a couple of years because the damage will be so severe. But either way, you're going to sustain permanent damage. If you look at the risk of dying on dialysis per year, age 66 to 74, it's one in four. If you compare patients without the need for dialysis, it's 1 in 40. So your risk of dying on dialysis is way higher than without dialysis. And it's also way higher than those who undergo a transplant for all the reasons we explained. So we've given examples of how the body gets damaged on dialysis. You start out with a pretty good body and over time you get damaged and some of this damage is permanent, which is why the sooner the transplant, the better. The other aspect of this question is to look at survival following transplant. If you look here is percent survival, the other axis is year. And you can see that the survival on dialysis after 10 years is very low. On the other hand, it's much better following a deceased donor transplant, and the best of all survival is following a living donor transplant. Living kidney donors are ultra healthy. They're among the healthiest people around, so their kidney is top notch. On the other hand, the typical deceased donor patient is a complex ICU patient who perhaps has undergone shock and resuscitation. So, of course, the kidney may have suffered and will therefore not be as good a quality as the kidney from a living donor. So why do living donor transplants provide the best survival for the kidney failure patient? Two reasons we've gone over. One, the patient is in much better shape because they have not undergone years of damage from dialysis. And number two, the kidney itself is of much better quality. This is why living donation is by far the best option for a kidney failure patient.